Hello, this is Diana with Sound Mind Ministries, where we know that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, as stated in 2 Timothy 1.7. Today's word is called Building, Preserving, and Preparing the Temple. Let us pray. Father God, only you can guide us in building preserving and preparing the temple. And I ask, Lord, that through your word, we would be able to see strategies in the Holy Spirit, uh, through the Spirit, with his guidance on how we can effectively build, preserve, and prepare the temple that you have called us to. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today um, I was studying uh, Ezra and uh, the Lord um, wanted me to share on building, preserving, and preparing the temple. And I, I want us to take a look at Ezra 3, 8 to 13, and then we'll do 4, 1 to 6, 12 to 15, and then 21 and 24. Um, you know, the Old Testament a lot of times is neglected. And uh, the Old Testament serves as a pattern for us, as a type, as a shadow for what is to be in the spiritual realm. So the Old Testament will present... Um, the Word of God and the physical realm so that we can understand how we are to live in the spiritual realm. So in Ezra 3, 8 to 13, um, the Jews were getting, they had gotten permission to restore the temple, the second temple. And of course, I just came from Israel recently and was at that wall surrounding the temple, the, as you know, as the Wailing Wall. But, of course, the second temple uh, has been destroyed. But this is when they were uh, they had permission to restore the second temple. And it says, Now in the second month of the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem, Zerubbabel, um, the son of Shetel, and, and forgive me for mispronouncing some of these words, Joshua, the son of Josedek and the rest of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all those who had come out of the captivity to Jerusalem began to work, and they appointed the Levites from twenty years old and above to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. So they needed Levites in order uh, to ensure that the sacrifices were done appropriately. So, skipping down to verse 10, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests stood in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals to praise the Lord according to the ordinance of David, the king of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his mercy endures forever toward Israel. Then all of the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. See, they were praising the Lord because the foundation had been laid and they were praising him with trumpets and cymbals and they were praising the Lord and giving thanks. But many of the priests and the Levites and the heads of the father's houses, the old men who had seen the first temple, they wept with a loud voice when the foundation of this temple was laid before their eyes. Yet many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the sound was heard afar off. So you had the older generation weeping because they thought they would never see the temple rebuilt. And they were so ecstatic that this had. Uh, been approved and had gotten to the point where the Jews could now come back and rebuild the second temple. And so you had a mixture here of generations, one weeping and one shouting. And we know that um, this is just the foundation. And so as we're going to see over in 1 Corinthians 
6, 19. Now, again, we're moving to the New Testament now, which is the spiritual. It says, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have a God, which ye are not your own. So they're building the temple in the physical. And now we're living under the new covenant, but we're to review the old covenant because that was the pattern because it's fulfilled in the new covenant. So because this is the pattern, we are to shout and weep and praise God when the foundation is laid in someone's life. So when someone comes to Jesus, the, the cornerstone, and lays the foundation, you know, Israel is part, is God, you know, this is where this was happening. So when someone comes to God and lays the foundation in their life, we may have thought, well, this will never happen. You know, they used to be a Christian. Now they've come back or they, they've strayed and now they've made a sincere uh, commitment to building their temple and the Holy Spirit. So this is uh, uh, the foundation we see over in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 11 says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So we need to rejoice when someone lays their foundation and starts building their temple um, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. So let's continue on here. Now what we're going to see in chapter 4, 1 through 6, and then 12 through 15, oh, here comes those who are going to resist it. Those who are going to try to tear it down and stop it. See, God calls us to build our temple where we can come into the Holy of Holies. We can do service unto him, sacrifice our time, our talents, and our treasure. And then you're going to have the naysayers, and you're going to have those in your life that's the enemy, the forces of darkness, that's going to try to come against you to stop the building of the temple. And this is what happens. Verse uh, Chapter 4 says, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel. They came over to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses, and they said, mm, spill, let us build with you, for we seek your God as you do. Now we know that's a lie because it says that they were the adversaries. So here they want to come and get mixed in and start helping you and start being a part of your building when they're really against it. They're an adversary, but they're saying to the king, we've sacrificed to him uh, who brought us here. Uh, but Zerubbabel and Joshua and the rest of the heads of the father's houses said to them, no, you may do nothing with us to build a house for our God, but we alone will build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. Then the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They troubled them in building. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days. And in verse 6, it says, they wrote an accusation against them. So here they are. Oh, you won't let us join you and help you build? See, this is, it says we alone must build because we alone, it's, it's a personal salvation. We have to work out our salvation alone with God. You have to get alone with God in order to build your temple, in order to come into the Holy of Holies and find out where does he want you to be of service? How does he want you to sacrifice your time, talent, and treasure? So they didn't like that. They wanted to be um, a, have a say when they were an adversary, and, and they were told no. And so what did they do? They started troubling them. They started hiring counselors against them. They started trying to frustrate them. They wrote this accusation, this long letter to the king, and it starts over in verse 12 of chapter 4. And they said, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us at Jerusalem and they're building the rebellious and evil city. See, they're already bad mouthing it. They're finishing its walls and repairing the foundations. 
which is that's what they're supposed to do. We're supposed to have boundaries around and protect the temple of the Holy Ghost within us. We are to have a foundation that is repaired, repairing the foundations. See, God who began a good work in you, we often are brought down and we stray and we need to come back and repair the foundations. He will be faithful to complete it to the end when we come back to him as a repairing of the foundation. But they're saying in this letter to the king trying to stop it, let it now be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls are completed, they're not going to pay you taxes and tributes and customs and the king's treasury is going to be diminished. Oh, now we're now with money. We're going to bring money into it. You cannot serve God and mammon. So now we're going to bring money into it and try to get the king's attention onto the, the financial part. Now, because we receive support from the palace, it was not proper for us to see that your king is dishonored. Oh, now we're going to bring in pride. Look, king, this is going to dishonor you. You're not going to get the money that you had before. So now we're going to get bring in pride. Look, king, it's going to dishonor, dishonor you. Therefore, we're going to inform you, king, that you need to search the book of the records of your fathers, and you're going to find in the book of these records, and you're going to find out that this city is rebellious, it's harmful to the kings and provinces, and they have incited sedition upon the city in former times. And that's the reason why this city was destroyed. Look, don't let them build it now because it's their fault that this happened in the first place. So they're bringing up all their past mistakes, all their past faults, saying, look, look, this is who they are. Uh, look at their past. It's going to dishonor you to be a part of this. You're going to lose money on this. So we inform the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the results will be that you're going to have no dominion beyond the river. Oh, now you're going to lose your power. See, pride, power, money. This is what they're appealing to. And so what happens when the king gets this letter? Well, he caves. <laughs> he caves. And down in verse uh, 21, he says, Now give the command to make these men stop, that this city may not be built until I give the command that they can go forward. So uh, it worked. What the enemy did, uh, it worked. They had to stop it for 17 years. They were in limbo. Uh, looking on verse 24, Thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased, and it was discontinued until the second year of the next king. So a new king had to come into place before they could continue the work of the Lord. So what happens during that time of limbo? That time when you think, Oh, well, God, you know, you gave me... All of these ideas, you gave me these, um, this ministry, you gave me uh, a, a purpose, and I thought I had it, and I was building it, and now you stopped it. So what do we have to do in that time of limbo when we think everything is stopped and we can't go forward? Oh, what we have to do is praise. We have to preserve the foundation that we already have. And as we preserve and we just be still and we know that he is God and that we bring a sacrifice of praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says that may the sacrifice of praise be to God. Be, may it be continually up on your lips. May it be the fruit of your lips. And we know that sacrifice is continuing to just give up my time my talent, my treasure, so that I can preserve the foundation that I have so that eventually when God gives the go-ahead, and eventually they did have the go-ahead to continue the build, I'll be ready. I'll be strong. I'll be built up. Uh, see Psalms 141.2, David says prayer is as an incense. And, and I'm going to tell you many, many places that I went in Jordan and I went in... Uh, Israel, they were burning incense in the shops and in the, in the little marketplaces as a symbol that that's their symbol, their physical symbol, that the incense is prayer. And it's, we lift up our hands as sacrifice, it says in Psalms 141.2. We lift up and we come and we pray on a, a, a daily basis. You know, we need to be in prayer 
many, many times throughout the day. And I'm not just talking about, oh, God, get me through this stoplight or get me, get me this, get me that. Or, you know, we need to be praying for interceding for other people. We need to be praying for our nation. We need to be praying for the Holy Spirit to um, build up the remnant. Um, we need to go beyond ourselves. And we need to go into the Holy of Holies. You know, I, I admire the Jews who come and pray three times a day. And the Muslims pray five times a day. And I'm, you know, we know Daniel prayed three times a day. We're given examples where we need to be on our knees. We need to take time away, turn everything off. Everybody shut out. And we need to get alone with him because that's how the temple is built. Um, I'm going to go over to 1 Peter 2. Let me get over there. 1 Peter 2, 4 to 7, it says, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. See, we are chosen of God and we are precious. Yet also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So when it looks like everything is stopped, you can continue to put stone up one stone, up one stone by offering your spiritual sacrifices and building your spiritual house to become a holy priesthood because we are kings and priests in the citizenship of, of the New Jerusalem. We are kings and priests in, in God's um, spiritual house. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. See, Jesus is our foundation. And as long as we're building on Jesus, the foundation, we won't be confounded when things look like it's stopped, when things look like it's being shaken. When they, it looks like we're getting uh, a new direction or off course or things aren't going as we planned, we will not be confounded when we're building the stone upon stone with our sacrifices and praises on the true foundation, Jesus Christ. And the first Peter 2, 7 says, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. See, Jesus came into his own and his own received him not. And many times uh, our families will reject us. Our friends will reject us. But, and they didn't, they didn't allow Jesus Christ. They, didn't, they wouldn't allow him. So what? He became the chief cornerstone. So sometimes the very thing that you think God is putting a stop to, or you think that you're being persecuted for, that's the very thing in which you will be building a true foundation upon, and that, that he may use that for your ministry. The very thing that the devil tries to tear you down, or the forces of darkness tries to come against you with, that is the very thing and the purpose and the call that he is building within your life. So that you can say, I've been in the pit in this area. And now I have, through the grace of God, he has brought me out of that pit, put me on the rock, the true foundation. And now I am going to build stone upon stone, the temple of Jesus Christ, which is within me and the Holy of Holies and that is within me. Father God, I ask that you take this word and that you would help each person that hears it to be able to build on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and that you would give them um, clear clarity, Lord, on, on the lively stones that they are to build as they're building the temple uh, where you will dwell and where they will commune with you in the Holy of Holies. Lord, I ask that you impress upon each person to spend time with you cut out time in their daily schedule to spend with you in prayer and reading your word, offering sacrifices, praise, and thanksgiving, and service, Lord God, as you direct them. And we ask this blessing upon this word in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.